So good afternoon, and thank you also very much for being here. Uh, Ruthie asked me earlier, uh, well, you know, what kind of event is this going to be? And uh, how many people do you think they'll be there? And to be honest, I didn't know. One o'clock, we normally do lunchtime things at 12. And I said, maybe between 50 and 30 people. And then um, I get this phone call from Chantal saying, well, there are twice as many people that fit into 120. Overbooked, Overbooked one, exactly. <laughs> 124, what should we do? It's, what do you, of course, then it's great that you're here. It changes the, um, the atmosphere and intimacy whenever we do things in Piper compared to when we are in a room which is very, um, very packed. And so I really do hope that you will participate. The, the intention was that this would be a very informal thing. Um, we're really, really happy that Ruthie and Richard are here with us uh, this week. And the plan has been um, for um, Ruthie to talk for maybe 20 minutes or so at the beginning, just to kind of set the scene. There are some images that she will also go through. And then we really want to have a very informal conversation with all of you. So please get ready to ask um, your questions. I think what is really wonderful about um, Ruthie is that she's had, you know, one very important partner in the, in the restaurant. What's going on now? Yes. Uh, Rose Gray, who sadly passed away maybe six, six or so years ago. And, you know, she's also, she has an incredible partner with Richard. And there are these, these very, very important relationships that have been so, so fundamental. I think that, um, that Richard um, showed a few slides of the River Cafe, but I think one of the things, and hopefully we will discuss this thing, but one of the things that has been so important is when you go to the office and you go to the restaurant, you see this really seamless relationship, the intimacy between the two and the interrelationship in terms of even the kind of the aesthetic of certain things, the quality of certain things, which I think is very much shared between food and architecture in a way. And uh, that's a very exciting part of, part, of, part of the discussion. One other thing I read somewhere when um, Ruthie was talking about the fact that, you know, making a criticism, and maybe she'll talk about this, of um, supermarkets about this, the, the whole preponderance of, of availability of things and choices of things. And her placing sometimes the emphasis, you know, on seasonality, sometimes on quality, things like this. But for us, I'm also one of those people who feels that seasonality is important in architecture too. And in a way, I think it's very interesting to discuss how um, both food and architecture are responding to these questions of the different times of the year and how we feel, in a way, in different spaces in different times of the year. Anyway. Ruthie, we're so happy that you're here, and it's really, really lovely. So um, I don't know whether you're ready to uh, get going, and you need to, now that we're sitting here, you probably need to use the mic. Oh, you can use this one. Yeah. Okay, that okay. one works. And then I can change the slides for you whenever you're okay. ready, so, yeah. Well, thank you very much, and um, I am really happy to be here. I think that, um, if, as I'm talking to people who are involved in the environment and architecture, and presumably go to restaurants and love restaurants. I thought I would just start by saying that the beginning of the River Cafe really was to do with architecture. It was to do with the architecture and the site. And that's something that stayed with us for all 30 years. We're going to be 30. Um, Richard and his partners bought uh, rather derelict warehouses on the Thames. And we always... Um, thought, Richard and I, when we came back from Paris, that we didn't want to just start an office, but we wanted a community, a place where people could have a space outside, where they could see a view, and um, clearly where they could eat. And so Richard and I were looking at various applications for a very tiny little space that would um, be a, a small restaurant, a cafe, a restaurant, in, this, in these warehouses. And um, on a fateful night, I said, you know, the only thing worse than not having a restaurant would be to have a mediocre one. I think I'll do it. And um, that's really sort of how it happened. 
I um, called up a friend of mine, Rose Gray, who had a bit of experience. I had absolutely none, except for being a passionate home cook. And um, she had done a bit of uh, cooking in restaurants. She'd helped a friend set up a restaurant in New York. And so the two of us went to look at the site, and we f decided to do it. And uh, it, the restrictions that we had at the time were that we could only be open at lunchtime, and we could only be open to the people who worked in the warehouses. There were architects, designers, stained glass window makers, uh, model makers. And as Moshe was just saying, it was those very restrictions that allowed two women to start a restaurant uh, who had never had a restaurant before in a rather far out place um, of London outside of, of the center and um, with, as I said, the restrictions of time. Uh, we started very small. Rose made, sat one day Rose would make sandwiches and I would do the pasta. The next day she would do the pasta, I would make the sandwiches. And uh, we struggled, we learned how to do this. And as I always say, we kind of grew with the restaurant. Six months later, we were allowed to open to um, the public. And then six months after that, we were allowed to be open in the evening. And so very, very, very slowly it grew. But those first years were, were quite tough. We, um, our competition was not other restaurants. Uh, it was the sandwich lady who came on her bicycle to sell sandwiches <laughs> to Richard's office. Um, but we had a great, um, we had a great team behind us in Richard's, Richard's partnership and accountants. And I think we set up systems right very, very from early from the start, which allowed us to be flexible and creative. But behind all of this, there was a quite a strong um, system. So the restaurant, yeah, I'll just show you. The restaurant um, now, this is, was taken um, probably about six or eight months ago. We had, as I said, we grew from a very, very small space and kept um, opening it up to make it bigger. And in 2008, we had a fire, um, a very serious fire, which we could have actually just repaired it, but we actually decided to reinvent the restaurant. And so we made it completely open. We used to be semi-open to the kitchen. And um, we decided to do a completely open kitchen to the restaurant. Um, Something I can talk about later is the drama of a restaurant. Something, I can't survive. But in 1987, when we opened the River Cafe, I think there were a lot of people opening restaurants. There was Alice Walters in San Francisco, there was Roly Lee, there was Wolfgang Puck, who were all thinking around the same lines, which was that you, know, you could either go to a very formal restaurant and be quite scared and intimidated, but eat very, very well, or you could go to a, the local trattoria and have a great time and be noisy and wear what you wanted to wear, but maybe not eat so well. So we thought, why can't we do both? Why can't we have a kind of great atmosphere um, inside, but also have very, very good food? And that also reflected the way I think that Rose and I cooked at home, which is that we both had open kitchens. Um, all the our children participated in cooking, which is, um, I'll talk about later, what we do at the the River Cafe. So we really wanted to expose the drama of the kitchen to the restaurant and the restaurant to the kitchen. So you can see that when you walk in, you see the chefs cooking, you see the bar, uh, a stainless steel bar, um, in which again, there's prep behind, and then the bright pink wood oven. Do you want to show the next one? Um, as I said, we have view is very important, the site is very important, so the windows look out on a green garden where we actually, um, to the right is our own vegetable garden where we plant. It's obviously not enough for the restaurant, but we have a garden that shows that you can grow an artichoke in West London, that you, we have borlotti beans and tomatoes. Um, we grow our own herbs, which we do use. And it's an education for the chefs um, to know about the seasonality. And it also is a way of exposing the people who are eating there to what's growing in the seasons. Yeah. And again, this well, that shows the vegetable garden. There's the River Thames, and the offices are um, behind that. So, um, okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, yeah. So, 
when, when Rose and I started, I guess the principles that we had for the River Cafe were that we wanted, we knew that we wanted to be Italian. Um, Rose uh, lived in Italy for five years and Luca with her family. My mother-in-law, Richard's family is Italian and Richard's mother um, was a fantastic cook. Her last words to me on her deathbed were Ruthie, she had fantastic skin, put more cream on your face and less herbs on your fish. And that, <laughs> and that was her. <laughs> and so uh, that was a huge influence on me. And so um, when when um, when we when we opened the restaurant, we knew that we wanted to be Italian. I had lived with Richard in Paris, and. Although French food was a huge awakening for me. We lived above the market. We saw the way people shopped in France that you, which is, it was something I always still say now, which is don't go to the market with a shopping list in your head. Don't go with the menu because you'll be running around looking for that ingredient. Go and see what's there and then decide what to cook. And um, that living in Paris taught me that. And we also spent all our money in Paris eating. We went to restaurants, we went to markets. We um, really, it was a time of sort of nouvelle cuisine in the 70s. Um, but everybody was talking about food. And for us, it was what we did when Richard wasn't working, we ate, we went to restaurants. But when I went to Italy, that was the real awakening for me when I realized that you could have um, a piece of grilled fish with just herbs on the top, when you, not too many, um, when you could have um, a bruschetta with just New Seasons olive oil drizzled over it. I thought, actually, this is the kind of food that I want to eat for the rest of my life and that I want to cook. I enjoy other food, but that Italian food for me, which growing up in upstate New York, I always thought that Italian food were, was very heavy, very rich. It was... Um, you know, eggplant with cheese and spaghetti with meatballs. And then suddenly you went to Italy and you saw how pure it was and how light it was and her few ingredients. Again, it also taught me that in France, if you had a piece of turbot, um, you would put a beurre blanc over it and spinach and delicious. But in Italy, you, there was no masking of the, of the source of the ingredient. And that's something that really influences our cooking in the River Cafe, is that if you have a great ingredient, if it's fresh, if it's seasonal, if it's, uh, it's of really good quality, you don't need to mask it. You don't need to put anything else on it. So. Um, so we started this restaurant uh, doing Italian food. And the seasonality is something that we've really, really stuck to. The idea that, um, again, like I say, go to the market and see what's there. Go to your fridge, see what's left over, and then you begin to cook. And that is really what we do in the River Cafe now, um, almost 30 years later. When we started, we had, um, as I say, about 25 or 30 covers. and. Uh, three, you know, last Sunday we had 245 for lunch, so it's a it's a big restaurant. But those principles of cooking it still um, are maintained. So what we do every day when we go to work, if you want to see the next slide, is um, we look. The first thing we do is we look at the order book, which has been left from the night before. And um, this is this is the hub of the River Cafe. So the chef who was on the night before will tell. Me, I haven't seen this one, which is, um, you can see what's been ordered. So from um, the uh, fish, we, we ordered sea bass. You can see we have sea bass, and they write down the price. You'll probably be shocked at how much it is. But we have, um, she's ordered sea bass, turbot, and monkfish and clams. And then from our meat supplier, she will have ordered veal chops, um, veal shin. And so you can see that she'll put the veal chops on at lunch and suggest that we do the veal shin at dinner. Um, grouse is in season now, so we always have um, a game, you know, we're having the game, so we have grouse. And then, that la then the lamb, which was ordered from the Rug estate, um, is lamb. So these are, you walk in and you see that this is what she, she suggested that I use, but I might do something. I might not, I might say, well, I'll put the clams, you see the clams there? I might put the clams in a spaghetti, or maybe I'll do a risotto, or maybe I'll do the scallops on the grill, and I'll do the squid in a pan, or maybe I'll do a black risotto with the cuttlefish. 
Um, and she's saying, you've got scallops, which you need to use for the night. So this is our kind of information. This is what we do, because the way we work in the River Cafe, which may be um, slightly unique, is that we write a menu every day for lunch and then another one for dinner. So the menu changes every day, depending on what we have, what's in the fridge, what we want to cook. Um, and you can also see that it's quite small menu. We have, I should have put a menu up here, but um, we have basically six starters, we have four pastas, and we have uh, three meat and three fish. Uh, we have, for cooking, we have a grill, we have a wood oven, and we have um, a sort of oven that we roast. So that also is, um, depends on who's, you know, what we're going to do. So that's how we start the day, and um, as I said, we we don't we don't have raspberries in the winter. We don't have people come in; and they're rather shocked sometimes. They say, "It's uh, I'd like to have a tomato salad," and we say, "We don't have tomatoes." And we say, "But this is an Italian restaurant; you have to have tomatoes." But we don't. So, you know, there are times that we actually <laughs> do struggle. You know, we don't. The only thing I think that comes by plane to the River Cafe is the mozzarella cheese, which is flown in from Naples. Otherwise, we we do use the Milan market. Um, as a source, because we just couldn't exist as an Italian restaurant with the British uh, produce. And oh, what's next? Maybe while we're on the <clears throat> on the um, sourcing of materials, can you say a little bit more about the question of where the stuff comes from and how much of it sure. is local, um, how yeah, much of it is yeah, from yeah. Italy? Like you just all, referred to it, but yeah, yeah. Bit. All our all our fish is uh, fished off the waters of of Britain, so we don't. Again, we don't have tuna, we don't have swordfish, um, but it's good. I mean, the fish that we have off our waters, it's wonderful. We have because it's cold, so we have uh, we have squid, we have mullet, we have turbot. Um, we have very close links with the. Uh, the, 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 the fishermen, we, well, there was one night when um, one of our fish suppliers called up and said, the, uh, the, the fisherman on the boat is about, he's reeling in a turbot and it's so big that we want to know whether you want it because if you don't, we'll put it back in the water. And you know, that was a fantastic contact that we have. It doesn't always work like that. But um, the scallops come on the train from Aberdeen. We like to imagine them sitting in first class, having enjoying their trip. <laughs> They, they come from Aberdeen. Um, and then our meat uh, is all organic British uh, beef and lamb. And as I said, the grouse is wild. So we, we, we do get all our meat and fish. And we've had the suppliers. We've worked with um, you know, Rushton, who's somewhere on this list, and H.G. Walters. As you can see, we only have one uh, butcher. We have two fish suppliers, and um, we've worked with them. It's a relationship, you know, you call, one of them said the scariest phone call they ever get is if, it used to be Rose, who was quite fierce, you know, calling up and saying that, whatever it was, that, um, you know, um, sea bass or whatever, or that pumpkin or the artichokes will not do, I'm sending them back. You, you, you establish a really trusting, it's very, very important to trust the people that you buy from. And it's a long relationship that we've had. Um, yeah? Um, then, uh, well, this is just the fridge list. So this will tell you um, what's left over from the night before. So you'll see there was, um, well, there's lentils, borlotti, there's chard, there's chicoria, langoustine, um, poached. And again, so the chef will look and see you know, whether they want to use these. It's important, you know, again, the margins in a restaurant are very, very important. So that is to do with wastage. But then again, you know, I will look at it and I won't like the way they cook the artichokes the night before and I won't use them. It's a, it's a constant juggling back and forth between what you do. And then there's the meat fridge and the fish fridge. So out of this, and then the next slide, um, we then sit, oh, that's the veg, that's a vegetable fridge which tells you what's in. So the way it works in the morning, I'll just go back just for a minute to the way the restaurant works. So we come in, and the other unique thing about when I said that Rose and I always had our children um, and our families helping with the food, it was something that we did together. We did that with the restaurant as well. We decided that the waiters who would 
work in the River Cafe would come in earlier than most waiters do to come and lay the tables. But they would come in when the chefs come in. So the day starts at about 8.30, quarter to nine. The, um, the chefs start prepping the food because everything we have is whole, whether it's whole legs of lamb, whole bass. Um, and they start prepping the fish. The head, the head chef and, and maybe one or two others will sit down and start writing the menu. And the waiters come in and put on aprons, and they do the prep. They peel the garlic, they, um, they, they, take the, they wash the spinach, they learn how to clean anchovies, salted anchovies. Um, and so they are there getting everything ready so that by the time the menu is written, the um, prep is kind of almost done. Uh, they'll grate the horseradish. They will come and say, are you making salsa verde? Do you need capers wash? They don't do any cooking. But what this does is it involves every single person. And the kitchen porters who um, come in and they wash the, the clams or they prep the vongole. They um, pick some of the crab. So every single person in the River Cafe is really involved in the food. And that creates a restaurant where the waiters are very... Um, interested in food, and it also makes them better waiters, because very often if a customer will say, how did you make the salsa verde, they'll know because they help prep it. So um, by that time, the, the menu is kind of done at 10.30, and then, then we start, the chefs start working. Ideally, they will have finished the prepping the fish and the meat, the waiters will be doing their thing, and then the menu will be written. And if you show the next slide, I think I show how we do the, no, the next one. Yeah, so basically, I just wanted to show this one because it doesn't look like they're very busy, do they? Many jobs, but um, what we do is we, unlike other restaurants, I think, where you are a pastry chef or you are a sauce chef or you are a salad chef, um, we assign the jobs to the chefs according to their ability every, every service. So we say, okay, today you, I can't see this one, um, you, Elliot, will be making pasta, and Jess will make the soup, and she'll do the lardo. Um, she'll, she'll be prepping the lardo. What is that? I can't say what that is. And then somebody else would do the um, crab. So everybody um, has a job according to what they do. And again, that makes for, I think, quite interesting job for the chefs. And they, they know that they will, they, their aim is to be, you, you wouldn't give a new chef job of making risotto. They might be blanching the spinach, but they know that one day they will be taught and they will learn and they will do more responsible um, cooking. So that, again, creates a kind of active, challenging place for the chefs to be. Oh, and this is, the, well, this is just the menu meeting we have. Um, I think one of the really important things I'd like to say about, well, there are several things. When, is the investment that we have in the people. A lot of restaurants are based on fear. It's a very old-fashioned idea, I think, that, um, that you get the best out of chefs by making them work very hard, by making them quite frightened by a kind of restaurant hierarchy. It was a very male-dominated um, profession. In the River Cafe, we have 50, we always have aim for at least 50% women to men. Sometimes there are more women less women, but we, we really aim for that. It makes a much better kitchen to have that mix. Um, and um, I think that what we also do is the idea of that we all go to restaurants for different reasons, but there's a lot of drama in a restaurant. There's the drama between the chefs and the waiters, between the chefs and the, and the other chefs, and then the drama between the waiter and the customers and between the people who are eating there, you know, that people go to restaurants to do, I would say, very private things in a very public space. People get divorced in restaurants, they get proposed to in restaurants, they get fired in restaurants. And so we see all this drama. And then the drama that goes on in the kitchen is also usually behind closed doors where waiters, you know, a chef has made a wonderful delicious pasta which is waiting there and if the waiter doesn't take it out it's going to be cold. So there's a lot of drama there. So what I think Richard did when he um, really worked on this restaurant, his team, was to say we want all this drama to be visible, to be transparent. We all want to manage our drama 
it, certainly we do. I don't know if the customers always do, but we try to. Um, it makes for a kitchen where nobody shouts, nobody yells. You can't because somebody will hear you. And also I can see the way my audience is eating. I can see if somebody doesn't like their bass. I can see if somehow the table's been waiting too long. And the last thing I suppose it really does enforce an open kitchen um, makes you, and it's, I think it's really important to be clean, you know, that um, you, know, you want to know, again, the food that you've cooked is coming from a kitchen that cares about the um, cleanliness of the kitchen. And so customers come and talk to me, they come and look at the food being cooked, they say, I'd like to try that, I'd like to try that. So, um, you know, I think with all that, uh, I have the best job in the world. It's, um, I work with brilliant people and um, it's challenging, it's interesting, and um, it's exciting. I think that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Cool. So um, I hope that we can, uh, we can open this up very, uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, please get ready. I don't know if we have any extra mics uh, for, for anyone. Um, but um, just in terms of um, the seasonality that you're uh, mentioning, so um, the inspiration, just in terms of year in, year out, how do you, how do you keep the restaurant on one level consistent, but at the same time, Different because one of the experiences that um, we have here, I've had in other institutions, is that when you have the same restaurant, uh, it's very difficult for the chefs to come up with sufficient variety in a way to keep the audience excited about the food. But you've managed to do that because I think, I know that you have many, many people who are really they spend a lot of time in your restaurant. They're 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 more than repeat, yeah. you know, no, customers. So how, it so it's amazing how people use that. Uh, yeah. So I was saying that. No, you, you know, need when, to. I, when I was when I was young, um, growing up, we went to a restaurant for a special occasion. We went for somebody's birthday. We went for an anniversary. We went, and I see the way, and we are on the expensive end of restaurants. And I see the way our restaurant is used. That. Kids come, people bring their families, they sit there for hours. The same people come on every Thursday, people come every Sunday. On Sunday, it's like, yeah, you know, it's a party. They all expect to see each other. There's, um, they come, you can see people walking quite distraught. They've had a bad time or they come in to celebrate. It's a very, and as far as seasonality goes, I think that's what keeps it interesting because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we really welcome the season. So when, in, this, in the beginning of May, when you have peas and you have broad beans and you have the baby artichokes, um, you're so excited to see, see these you know, wonderful ingredients. And then after about two or three or four months of green, you know, you're really longing for the autumn. I mean, right now, I think autumn is actually really the cook season because we have porcini we're coming in, we have pumpkins, we have just starting to have white truffles, we have um, wonderful um, broccolis and chicorias. And so then, and then after that, you begin to think, okay, you know, now it's time for the next season. And so you get um, the bigger artichokes and you start, you know, you start thinking again. Sometimes you have to really remember how to cook something because it's been a year since you've cooked it. And, um, and I think that seasonality really keeps us going. And, um, you know, just when you, you know, you sort of say goodbye to a vegetable or a fruit and you sort of feel like you're saying goodbye to something. And then something, you know, you're saying goodbye to melons, but you're saying hello to uh, yellow peppers, you know. And so it, it is something that keeps us going. And again, it's about choice. I was saying that I was in a panel with a super, we were talking a lot of talk about wastage, um, food wastage. And there was the head of Sainsbury's, which is a big uh, supermarket in Britain. And he was just saying how important it is to have choice. You know, that you have to have this huge range of choice for the shopper. And I was there with some other chefs, and we were saying, actually, quality is much more important than choice. You know, that why do people have to have 
strawberries flown in from New Zealand, and our, you know, and you don't. I guess the United States is much easier because it's a bigger country. But we have so much food that is flown in to um, Britain, which makes it expensive. It isn't very good, and it isn't important. Right. I, w I maybe people have some, but I would love to get to the bottom of this relationship between seasonality and the recipe, if you can put it like this, because. Richard, in the earlier seminar um, with John, was talking about the fact that, you know, about the importance of holidays, and everybody should have at least five weeks holiday a year, which I think is a, I'll vote for that. I think that's a very, that's a very good, that's a very good thing. But you, you both spend a lot of time in Tuscany, and I assume that that also, for example, gives you the opportunity to try different things or go to your local restaurants and be surprised by things. Mm -hmm. um, so on one level, seasonality, you know, I mean, to compare it to architecture, is about the range of materials in some sense. And then there is still the idea of recipe of the way in which you put these together. Now, you, you mentioned the thing about French food, the French food requiring a lot of, you know, it's more complicated in some sense and maybe sometimes more technical, but the simplicity of Italian food nevertheless also has its own incredible kind of recipes. So uh, it's, it's interesting that you, you, of course, now have your own history of how you do things in the River Cafe, but how you might encounter new ideas, new recipes. I would love to sort of know well, how, you, how you change things that way. Uh, like, you know, as Richard said last night, you don't really think about the idea you know, that um, you don't have an idea. It's a process, just like anything else you do of cooking every day. But I think the two things that are, interest me also about is regionality and seasonality. And so we live in, uh, in the summers, we stay between um, Montepulciano and Siena. And uh, we decided, I probably was with the Coddles, we were going to do porchetta. And I, I went into the butcher and we ordered the pig and we had it and he said, which you said to me, um, how are you going to cook this? And I thought, ha oh, you think I'm some, you know, American tourist. I said, I'm going to do it the way you do. You know, I'm going to do it the way you do here. I'm going to do fennel seed and salt, you know? And he said, fennel seed and salt, that's what they do in Montalcino. Now, Montalcino is about, what, 35 miles from Montepulciano, <laughs> you know? But it was so, that regionality. So you have recipes that are so, tight on the on not only the 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 sort of tuscany but it can be to do with southern tuscany or northern tuscany it can be to do with uh, the town which is montalcino versus montepulciano or it can be the the mother you know the family um, i always say that i once stayed with richard's cousins and there was this huge fight going on downstairs and i went into the kitchen and two sisters were arguing whether you make a papa pomodoro which is a soup and one of them wanted to put just the tomatoes and the bread, and the other one to put some water in it. And this was an argument that went on and on and on. And I just thought that passion for the way you cook and the way you do it. And I think there also is, like architecture, you not only need, the simplicity comes from relying on the quality of the ingredients. So you can't just do bruschetta with olive oil and chicoria. You know, if the bread isn't sourdough bread, if it isn't grilled, the correct way, if it isn't just very slightly rubbed with garlic, if it isn't um, the new season's olive oil over the chicoria. And I think that, you know, and it doesn't have to be expensive, but I think the, the, if you, if the quality of the ingredient, and I also say if you're going to make a soup, I used to talk about making ribolita, which is a bread and vegetable soup and beans, that if you don't have the foundation, the soup will fall apart. So there's something called the sofrito, which is to do with you. You cook all the you cook the onions and the garlic and the herbs until it becomes one herb, you know. But that allows you to just add bread and beans and and uh, cabbage because you have the space. So it is a bit like right. you know, no. Norway. We have the same thing, don't you think, between Cambridge and Somerville? When if you the difference in <laughs> <laughs> new nuance of preparation, yes, with fennel seed, without fennel seed. So. Please, uh, do, do, do. Okay, um, there, Dana, please. There are two people there, thank you. Um, so you talked about the economics of your, of your restaurant 
Is there a scalability, an economic scalability to maybe reach a broader audience? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, obviously the, there is a kind of rarefied existence to my, my restaurant. We have, we are an expensive restaurant. Um, I think we're a fair restaurant. I mean, it's what we do, the, the quality of the food that we buy. If you can see the price of the turbot and the bass, I could buy cheaper fish. I could um, use less expensive olive oil and I could, you know, pay less rent and I could, there's a lot I could do to make it to a wider um, audience. And I would, I think that's, I would like to do that. You know, I, I think a lot about um, how we could make a kind of river cafe cafe, for instance. Um, I also really, it's embedded in our, in all the people who work in the restaurant that we're lucky to have anybody who comes and sits down and eat. And so if somebody has, um, you know, a pasta and a salad, that's fine. You know, that every everybody can eat uh, to whatever they can. Or there's, we, we try and really cost our wines to the to right level. But... Um, it, it, it's a challenge, you know, to do to do what we do um, with with the cost that we have. We have, I would say, that people might not come to the River Cafe because of what it costs, but we get very we get a lot of complaints. You know, people tell us about this, but rarely do we have anybody say I was taken for a ride or I was, you know. Um, it also allows us to invest in our staff um, the, that we. Um, I think we pay our wages. Really, really well. I think we also take twenty people. To, I'm just trying to tell you the good things we do. Um, we to every November and actually the week after next, we will take twenty people who've worked in the River Cafe. The, the deal is you have to have worked for two years to Tuscany to um, because we buy the oil, we bottle our own olive oil, and so we go to the uh, winemakers who produce the olive oil, and we take uh, ten people to. Uh, Tuscany, and then we'll take another. We can't take 20 out of the restaurant, and then we take another 10 to Piemonte. And this exposes them to Italy. It exposes them to the food. They learn about the production of olive oil. Um, again, uh, our, the people who work for us, all the chefs, are um, they, they can only do one double shift a week. They have to have two days off in a row. They, you know, they, it, I think that allows us in a way to have that kind of, if you have a, uh, uh, another kind of restaurant, I think investing in your staff is, it might be a bit more challenging, but um, that's who we are and that's what we do. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm in, anchored in the city of Chicago, which is being reconstructed uh, because of its bipolarity of its landscape. You have an interesting have, have not dichotomy um, and the reclamation of formerly urban spaces has been mainly brought up through the production of food. There's a lot of urban agriculture. Yeah, and so I'm, exciting. I'm in that world. I do uh, year-round food production in an old warehouse that we reclaim to do aquaponics and fish production and stuff. But we, we have our audience is more of marginalized population, yeah. and our relationship with the restaurants is actually helping to bridge some gaps between uh, yeah. humans. And the, the power of food right now particularly in this moment in history, um, yeah. is so important. Uh, so I was curious, you know, Lisa and Michael Cornick are on our board, and it, it has helped yeah. us immensely having the restaurants speak yeah. up and bridge politics, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've, uh, um, well, if you've connected we, with schools. Well, we are, um, there are several, you know, there's a lot of that thought going on now about how restaurants can, it's again to do with waste and how, or, you know, how we can recycle, how we can get food out to the community. Um, we ourselves do quite a lot of work with community. We um, teach in women's refuges. We um, help in schools. We've tried to work a lot on food programs. But I think that it's, um, it's, it's a disgrace that um, there aren't vegetable shops in poor, you know, poor areas that um, children are fed the worst school, the food in schools. It starts out from the very, very beginning. If you look at the way the French government feed their children, in um, you have to just walk down the street in Paris and see an école maternelle. They put out the menus for the week, and you realize that that's those are state schools, and that the priority on food and culture. And, and education at a very early level as an investment in the society. What's interesting for us is because they're actually hiring our kids 
and so it we it it's it's bridging it very intentionally around labor and food production. Yeah. And so that's yeah. it's been really amazing. So. No, it's a, we we're all trying. But there's there's another initiative where we're working, um, in Hackney, which is a low income area, of starting um, chicken outlets, which are, but with good chicken, but you know trying to get. Um, these and, and it's kind of worked on a cooperative basis. So there, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of work to be done. Chantal, you have the mic. Why don't you ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> Chantal, Chantal is one of the most uh, exquisite uh, people about food, and this is her copy of the River Cafe that I'm going uh, to ask you to uh, sign, Ruthie, for for Chantal. <laughs> Uh, she doesn't know it, but I took it from her office. Uh, so Chantel, she's always buying really good food. So uh, thank you very much for. You're welcome. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> to the chef, thank you for coming, and um, I I especially enjoyed uh, the glimpse into your working process. Um, I. I think that, I, I guess my question is, did you invent all of those systems that you use just based on trial and error and what works best for you? Or did you model your ways of working on other existing restaurants? Because I think it's, it's a kind of creative labor that's maybe not often given enough credit, these kind of ephemeral but um, systems that structure how they organize all the activities um, of production. Um, well, I think we did pretty much do it our way. You know that we, as I said, we started so small that we came in. I mean, I think that Rose and I, it was as much that it was an amazing partnership, uh, and I often think that it was based on two women who voted the same, had the same politics raised our children the same way, um, had the same view of the world of not just cooking, but the kind of restaurant we wanted to have in terms of participation. And I think it was that participatory thing that started us all off, you know, whether these systems about writing everything down or looking in the fridge or um, that, that probably evolved um, as we were losing more and more money. But um, I think that the, the, the ethos of the restaurant of investing in your staff, of taking everybody as an inv individual. Um, I often people often look at the River Cafe and think, oh, we're just a kind of happy family, you know, very sort of loving place, and we are. But behind that, there is a really, really strong discipline of systems. Whether and that's just part of it. What I just showed you was the kitchen list uh, to start. But we have, an, you know, if I always say if I if I drink a cup of coffee in the River Cafe, I pay for it. You know, if um, I eat there, I pay for it. We have, obviously, discount. You know, it's a discount, but everything is written down. If somebody burns an almond tart, it's written down. If somebody sends back a piece of sea bass, they didn't like, it's written down. And so, at the end of the month, we, you know, we have a very um, strict accounting system. So I know how much we paid for flowers. I, I say I. I have four partners now since Rose died, who are, you know, work as a team. And so we're all kind of work. And so that, I think. That, that discipline allows us to be generous. I think that system allows us to take people to Italy. That system allows us to, you know, invest in charitable um, cooking causes and, and, and initiatives. So I think it is based on that. Um, maybe Chantal now you can give the mic to Anita. I'm, <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so please, if you have one or two quick questions, I know some people have to teach or others have class, but raise your hand and, yeah. So if we can get the other mic here as well, please, in the second row. Anita, please. So I uh, loved your book. It was... Um, oh, you brought your copy as well? I brought I my <laughs> copy. Um, I, I have never had the pleasure of going to the restaurant, but I will tell you that the book was central to my kitchen when I was raising my children. Um, uh, and we were very sort of cooking centric as well, and um, and the book was an attraction for them. The way it was designed, the way it was photographed, uh, I uh, had them choose things uh, and be invested in in the process. 
in the process. And uh, now that I see the images of your restaurant and the, how they relate to the graphics of the book, can you say something about the production of the book as an extension of, of your work at the cafe? Well, the book started, you know. Yeah, Mike. Oh, uh, yeah, we, when we opened the restaurant in 1987, and then I think a few years later, people were saying, maybe you should you know, write a book. And we kept saying, we're chefs, we're not authors. But we realized that there were a few reasons to, to write a book. One was that it would work as a kind of guide to the chefs who came in, because we, we had all these recipes. And so that would you know, help the people working. And it still does. We'll refer them to a recipe. And, um, uh, and then what we wanted to do was create a book, as you say, that was a bit that reflected the way we work. You know that it was we had a we wanted no text that it would just be a recipe, and then we would photograph. We didn't go to a studio. We would cook it the way that Rose and I did cookbook one, and actually all the cookbooks was that we'd we'd go up, so we'd write the recipe, we'd um, we'd cook the food, we'd get it correct, and then with the photographer would put it on a table next to the kitchen and photograph of it. And, and we wanted it to be honest, so that if you used these ingredients and you cooked it, it would look like this. And it wouldn't be specially lit. It wouldn't be overblown. We never wanted a carrot to be bigger than a carrot um, we, on, you know, on the page. We wanted it to reflect. And when they first, when we did the first book, when we didn't want to, we wanted a typographical cover. I think we were one of the few cookbooks that didn't have a picture of food on the cover. I remember our publisher was horrified. And we thought that maybe, I think the first, um, run was 3,000 copies um, because they thought only the people who would eat in the River Cafe would know. And um, there you go, you know, it's a kind of says. But we loved, I mean, one of the, you know, I miss many, 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 every day I miss Rose, you know, I just, we had such a fantastic relationship and I like to think that everything we do now, she is reflected in Rose, but uh, that Rose is reflected in what we do. But, you know, sitting up at that desk and writing recipes or going to Verona or going to Puglia to get the, um, you know, to the sourcing for the recipes was one of the great, you know, the great luck that I had in my life. Yeah. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the big surge in reality television shows about food these days. Um, going back to Iron Chef and Hell's Kitchen and now Chopped and Top Chef and Top Chef Junior, where you literally have eight-year-olds competing on national, national you spend television. spend a lot of time watching TV. <laughs> I, I actually don't watch a whole lot of that, but um, I was just wondering if you think it's sparking a healthy um, interest in food amongst the general public, or if it's more misrepresenting the food industry as a whole. Um, that's a good question. I think that it's both. I mean, I think that I welcome the the change that people are so interested and particularly you know I think Jamie Oliver who worked for me for five years really inspired men to cook you know he made for young boys cooking fun and sexy and interesting and and I think that Gordon Ramsay um, as I used to be really upset about that that did upset me because I know Gordon and he's actually a very nice guy and he runs his kitchen very well but the idea that the the image of the chef as somebody who bullied and shouted and made you feel inferior. And it was, I thought it was just, I used to say, if it, you know, if it was a journalist or if it was an architect, you'd be dismayed to see your profession portrayed in that way. So, um, like, my, I don't watch that many of those shows, but I do think that um, the good ones are very good. And I think it is fantastic that people are buying cookbooks and that people are cooking. And um, if, as I said, I don't know. I would, I'm sure there are ones that are better than the others. But, um, you know, I grew up on Julia Child. That's how old I am. And um, it, was, it was inspiring. And it was, you know, it was good. Um, so in many ways, your restaurant is an institution within the London community. And I'm partly biased because my parents are restaurateurs and have been operating a restaurant almost as long as yours. Um, and they themselves are kind of dealing with this this notion of how does the identity of the restaurant endure over time, especially as maybe they scale back their involvement in the in the business. And I'm interested to hear, especially given you know the course of the past few years as the restaurants evolved after the passing of Rose, how you grapple with you know maintaining this River Cafe identity that is so much defined by its founders, um, despite you know the limitations that time 
offers? Well, I think, you know, I said when Rose died, I felt um, like a parent, a single parent, but I had 80 children, you know, and it was, it was a real, it was a, a point of fear, but there was a sense, there was never a thought that we were, and, she, you know, she, she was ill for quite a long time. And um, I think it's all based on the team. It's, you know, I'm there every day. I'm not here today, but I, when I'm in the restaurant, when I'm in London, I go to work every day because, A, there's no place else I'd rather be, um, and except, you know, sorry, Richard. <laughs> 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 um, and also because I think if I still find it exciting and challenging and interesting, then, then my team will. And the people I work with are so incredible that we, you know, it, it, you know we have it, we have been there 30 years, and, but I never think about how can I make it fresh or how can we make it appealing or what we can do. All we try and do every day is cook better, you know, to be a better restaurant, to be a restaurant that is um, uh, welcoming and dramatic where the food is so delicious you want to sit there. And it is, it's, you probably feel the same way, you know, the, our job is so great because basically you just want people to leave happier when they leave than they arrived. You know, that's a bottom line. And, you know, why do you go to a restaurant? You could stay home and just, you know, eat in your kitchen. But, and um, I think there is a real sense of going out. And people who work in restaurants really have to like people, apart from liking food. And um, so far, we've, we've met, you know, we, we do do things. I mean, I think architecturally, we try and do things that, you know, so we might paint the wood with oven pink instead of white. We might now put another, um, we have a pastry kitchen, or we might change various things, or, you know, but, and we're always trying to make it better. But I never think about, you know, whether it could be different. It's just better. Richard, what is your uh, favorite recipe? What's the, f what's, what's the thing you, you like the most in terms of, food that Ruthie has cooked for you or you've eaten in the River Cafe? My problem is that I like it all. <laughs> um, I mean, I love the fish. I love the little red rouge. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the wild ducks and the wild pheasants. Um, I, it, all the strong tastes I love. I prefer, I have a stronger taste probably than the English public can take. And I'd probably go further in that direction, but I love it. Richard is our harshest critic. He is I think very, that, uh, very careful. It is a fa it's an amazing life. I mean, it took uh, a long time. I mean, we didn't make a profit for seven years. Um, and it does take a long time and very careful patience. patience. And I think Ruthie Lander playing, I mean, she was always uh, interested in lettering and uh, laying out of books and so on. That's her passion. She worked on Pompidou on, on that end too. So, you know, it's, there are a lot of people who have come to, to, come to fruition in doing that work. And I love watching these people. People who, in the early, early days, the people were sort of out of work actors because they're more out of work actors than anybody else, certainly for short times. Now it's become more professional. Um, people stay much longer. And it's fantastic to watch. It's a real dance. It's a fantastic theatre, and I love theatre. I'll tell you one story, in case we need to, to stop before we do, which, and I talk about the drama that takes place in a restaurant, and there are a lot of dramas. We had somebody who called up, and he said, would you please make a cake? And would you write, will you marry me, on the cake? Because I'm going to propose to my girlfriend. So we all were very, you know, we wrote, will you marry me, on the cake? And, you know, we watched them have their meal. And he finished his first course. In the middle of the main course, he came up to the chef and he said, would you please cancel the cake? <laughs> <laughs> so we always wonder what happened, you know? <laughs> Why did they cancel the cake? <laughs> so. That's quite scary. <laughs> I hope there wasn't a cake that was being planned somewhere. Um, uh, what, what is so exciting is really the influence across the, the, the courtyard, in a way, between, the, the, between you two. Because I thought that the, um, the list, in a way, is very inspiring. That's why I think the connection to materials. I'm just wondering whether you ever sat down with Richard and said, this is how we deal in terms of the interrelationship between materials and making, and see if 
if it if they could make something of it in terms of the practice, I mean, in terms of choices of things, how they're put together. Um, There's a uh, lot of dialogue. Yeah. I mean, I do think that we miss, you know, Richard moved out. And there was a lot of dialogue between the two of us, whether it was, can you come over and look at this drawing or this model or whatever, and I would say, can you come over and taste the pasta sauce? You know, that there was a, a really back and forth all the time. But I also think through um, the architects in the office that they were in the restaurant a lot. And um, we had a special set price meal for the architects who worked. But you could see that um, they would come over and they were really interested in the way, in, in the kitchen. They were interested in the way um, we, you know, people are, you, you go to a restaurant, and, you know, it's like a bit like going to play. How do you do it? You know, how, how do you come in, you know, how do you make sure that, and it is rather theatrical that the food all comes out at the same time. Somebody making a pasta, somebody making a, a grilling a piece of lamb, and it, it's ready on the, to go out to a table. How, I always think it's quite theatrical. I can understand why actors wanted to work in restaurants, because, um, you know, the, th the curtain goes up at 12.30, and by 12.30, the floor has to be swept, the um, salsa verde has to be made, the lemons have to be cut, the ice cream has to be churned, the, you know, it, it goes on and on, the napkins on the table have to be cleaned, the wine has to be um, chilled, and the espresso machine has to be um, cleaned and the new beans put in. So how does all this happen so that when you walk into a restaurant and the curtain goes up, it's done. And it's because it's so, it's so, it's why it's very, very good for young people to work in restaurants. All my friends want to send me their difficult children because it is actually, it's really important because if you, if you mess up in a restaurant, it's not your boss who's going to get angry at you. It's your colleague mm -hmm. because if they, they need to go and, um, you know, if the menu hasn't been written or this, or the um, lemons haven't been cut, then their customer is going to wait. Or if, if the waiter doesn't bring it out, their pasta will be cold. So it's, it's very, very much. And it's also a place where you have to act. You know, you may come in in a bad mood. Your boyfriend might have broken up with you or your girlfriend might have left or you might feel hungover from the night before. But the bottom line is that you have to perform. And I think that is a really, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's good, you know, that you leave, you will, and I, it's been good for me in difficult times that I walk through those doors and you are in a different, you know, you're in a world of, that, I mean, architecture, I would say that somebody, eats, you know, Richard builds a building or designs a building and it's years and years and years, but it lasts for years and years and years. And I create something and it's like eaten in five minutes. You know, <laughs> so. no, but I think what, what is so wonderful is that, you know, what you're saying about the, the performative, the performance mm. of that, I think you're also, as you're discussing it, I think you're also linking that performance to a certain level of precision and a certain way of execution. So I think that's also very important in terms of the connection with architecture. I mean, what I love about the River Cafe is that unlike so, I mean, we also live within a culture where it seems like sometimes the more you do, the more food there is, the more you combine, uh, the better somehow. And I think, you know, with the River Cafe, uh, in a way, it's not about that, it's about it's not the it's not about minimalism, but it's actually about the judgment of doing something that is correct in some ways. So I think there is a lot of precision yeah. to get that performance, and I think that is also something else that's very good to have a kind of consistency between um, you know ar the architecture and the restaurant and people eating in the restaurant. I mean, I sometimes feel that in a way we you know what we should eat around here should also be in a way consistent with what we are talking about in architectural terms. And it seems very strange sometimes if you are discussing architecture in a very precise way and then you eat food that is not very precise. But we're, we're in the middle of the strike. So yeah, but it's the same thing as eating, it's the eating food. You know, I was, you know, I was, I could never imagine doing a restaurant in anything but a Richard space, you know, or, serving food in somebody else's, you know, it's, it's, it's so important to us the way 
the vis you know the the visual quality of the restaurant, the environment, the way we put the tables, whether they're near each other, the way the lighting is, um, the view. As I said, that's all part of the eating experience. Sure. Anyway, Ruthie, thank you so much for today, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.